It's good to be at Trinity. I didn't say this earlier, but before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much for your partnership in the gospel. Because of you, because of your generosity, because of your prayer, the gospel goes out to the nations. And so thank you. It's such a joy to be your partner in the gospel these, over these years. All right, this morning we are considering a few events in the biography of David. We just had 1 Samuel chapter 25 read for us, uh, which was a large section, but our sermon text is actually even larger than this. We're going to be looking at three chapters this morning, chapter 24, 25, and 26. And the reason we're doing this is because what we have in this three-chapter block is what Hebrew scholars call a chiasm. And I had a professor in seminary who used to say that was a technical word for a sandwich. What we have in these three chapters is a literary sandwich. In chapter 24 and in 26, uh, we have an encounter between David and King Saul. And as we will see, these encounters follow a very distinct pattern. They are the bread of our sandwich. But in chapter 25, what we have is an encounter with Nabal. And and Nabal is the, the chicken patty or whatever sandwich you prefer. And David's encounter with Nabal makes the sandwich delightful because it helps us comprehend what David is doing in his encounters with Saul. All right, with that background in place, let's pray together and then we'll dive in to God's word. Father in heaven, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes and open our ears this morning so that we might see the glory and beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom all of your promises are yes and amen. We ask this in his name. Amen. All right, so it might be helpful to be reminded where we are in the biography of David. In the previous chapters, David has been on the run from King Saul. Jonathan, Saul's son, has recognized that it is the will of the Lord that David be the next king and not him. And he loves David so much that he helps David flee from his father. And so as David is fleeing from Saul, he stops by this city, the city of Nob, which is like this priest-run city. And there he gathers weapons and food for his flight from Saul. And so when Saul learns that these priests help David, unaware that David has fallen out of favor with the king, Saul orders his men to kill everyone in every one of those priests in that city. But the Israelites refuse to do so, and so he commands an Edomite to do it. And so as Saul is killing his own people and priests by the hands of an Edomite, David is in another region defending the people of God from the Philistines. And so Saul hears of this, and David is concerned that Saul is going to do to this city that David just defended what he just did to the city of Nob. And so David, is he flees into the wilderness. And so like Pharaoh chased the Israelites into the wilderness, now Saul is chasing David there. And Saul would have captured him if it would not have been for another attack by the Philistines in another region. But in chapter 24, which we're considering this morning, Saul is back on the hot pursuit of David, and things do not look good. David is hiding in a cave. Saul has 3,000 trained warriors, and he knows that David's in this specific wilderness. David has 600 men, some of whom are family members, And others, they're not like these trained warriors looking for a noble cause. No, these are citizens who are in some kind of desperate situation. They are debtors or destitute in some other way. So David is outmanned, outgunned, and out of his league. But then something wonderful happens. As they are hiding out in that dark cave, King Saul walks in. Perhaps his eyes are still adjusting from the brightness of the sun. He is unable to see David's men. He walks in, he drops his proverbial pants, and he relieves himself. He is the picture of complete vulnerability. 
He's away from his men because it was unlawful for there to be a toilet in the middle of an Israelite war camp. He is unaware of David's men and he is preoccupied. And David's men see this as a sign from God. I mean, what are the odds? In verse 4, they say, of cha- verse 4 of chapter 20, For they say, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I have given your enemy into your hand. You shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. But instead of slaying Saul, David stealthily approaches him, cuts off the corner of his robe, and he says to his men in verse 6, The Lord forbid that I put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. This restrains the men, and Saul exits the cave. And a few moments later, David follows after him. And with proof in hand, David shows Saul that he is not out to get him. David evokes the name of the Lord to judge between him and Saul. He says, if I wanted to kill you, I could have. And so Saul is then filled with remorse. Now fast forward to chapter 26. Saul is once again pursuing David in the wilderness. But this time, David isn't just hiding out and running from Saul. No, he is on the search for Saul as well. He sends spies out. And when spies discover the war camp of Saul, they report to David. And David and Abishai, his relative, decide that they're going to sneak down into the camp after nightfall. Now, the way the camp is arranged is Saul is sleeping in the middle of the camp. And all of the soldiers are sleeping around him. And so after the night falls and people go to sleep, uh, David and Abishai sneak into the camp and they discover Saul sleeping in a deep sleep with a spear stuck into the ground above his head. And you may recall this is probably the same spear with which Saul repeatedly tried to nail David to the wall during his fits of rage. And so Abishai says in verse 8, God has given your enemy into your hand. Now please let me pin him to the earth. I will only strike once. But David again responds, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be found guiltless? And so they take the spear and a, a water jar and when they put enough space between them and the camp, David yells out once again, and confronts Saul. With proof in hand, he shows that he is not out to cause Saul trouble. Saul admits his sin, and fittingly, Saul's last words to David are that of a blessing. And so, in both of these encounters, we see it follows a basic pattern. There is an opportunity for David to take out King Saul and to secure the kingdom, but he doesn't do it. He refuses to put out his hand against the Lord's anointed. Now the question that looms large in these two encounters is why on earth does David not kill Saul, the Lord's anointed, and seize the kingdom? David has already been anointed the next king. The kingdom belongs to him. Saul is plainly trying to kill him. David is in a desperate situation and has a wonderful opportunity to solve his problem, even perhaps saving his own life in the life of his men. Why won't he lay hands on the Lord's anointed Saul? And so to help us answer this question, we're going to look to the chicken patty of our sandwich in chapter 25. This is David's encounter with Nabal. Now, at the outset, there are two things you need to notice about this section of Scripture. First is that the name Nabal means fool. It's probably footnoted in your Bible. And then secondly, this interaction occurs within the context of the prophet Samuel's death. And so, we wonder, how is David going to engage with fools in the absence of Samuel's restraining judgeship in the ministry of the Word of God to him? How was he going to treat fools of which King Saul has gradually become the archetype? And so the story begins with David and his men in the wilderness, and they're not out there just running and hiding out any longer. No, they have become this 
uh, disciplined military unit, and they are creating law and order on the countryside. Because the wilderness wasn't just a place of natural danger. No, this was a place of lawlessness, of crime, of bandits. The way that the shepherds working in this area later would describe David and his men, he said, they said this, David and his men were a wall by day and by night that protected us from those who would do us harm. And so David is basically out there protecting the investment of Nabal, the rich man on the block. He has 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And so when David hears that Nabal is shearing his sheep, he sends his men to make a very humble request that they join him on a feast day. Now, David's request is a reasonable one for a few reasons. First, as I mentioned, David is providing an invaluable service to Nabal. So just like David subdued the Philistines and thus secured the kingdom for Saul, apart from the law and order that David has established on the countryside, Nabal would have no sheep to shear. Second, the time of sheep shearing in this culture was a time of festivity, of generosity, especially to those who are away from home. And so David and his men were ideal candidates for this rich man's benevolence. Third, Nabal was a Calebite, a group that had been incorporated into the tribe of Judah. In other words, they were related. And then further, Nabal was very rich. And so this was not an unduly burdensome request on David's part. And so just as there were ample reasons for Saul to treat David well, so is the case with Nabal. But this is not what happens. Nabal responds to David's men by basically saying, David who? Despite betraying the fact that he does know who David is and even knows that he's anointed as the next king we see from his wife, he basically says to David, you are a nobody, get out of here. Now, David's response is, every man strap on your sword. He swears, he makes an oath that he is going to destroy every male belonging to Nabal. This would have been a very intimidating, intimidating sight. 400 armed men heading your way. But before this can happen, Abigail, the wife of the fool, who is described as both both discerning and beautiful, intervenes. In the absence of the prophet Samuel, Abigail becomes a messenger of the wisdom of God. Without telling her husband, she sends out gifts in advance, and she goes out to David and his men to plead for mercy. She takes the blame for her husband's foolish actions, and then she makes a theological argument in verses 26 to 31, for why David ought not destroy the fool, which is the theological argument for why David ought not lay hands on King Saul, the Lord's anointed. Now, like most good sermons, she has three points. She says, do not slay this fool because of blood guilt, because of self-salvation, and because of the promise of God. So blood guilt here has this kind of internal and external dimension. The internal dimension is that sins such as this will cause a conscience to be burdened by the guilt of sin. By avoiding this, she says in verse 31, My Lord shall have no cause for grief or pangs of conscience, uh, for having shed blood without cause. In other words, David, if you do this, this decision will live in your heart, in your head, for the entirety of your reign. And it will affect your reign in the kingdom for the worse. You know, this sadly foreshadows the impact of David's sin with Bathsheba. When David killed Uriah to get what he wanted, he arguably became a subdued king for the remainder of his rule. You know, this is a warning not to gravely wound our conscience, because by doing so, we, have, we are profoundly affected on the way we live our lives. You know, blood guilt also is this external dimension. You know, enacting such bloodshed on the very people you would subsequently rule is not a wise path to a stable kingdom. She says in verse 28, don't do this. The Lord is making you a sure house. 
If you go this route, David, your kingdom is destined for instability. You know, this is the same for the slaying of King Saul. If David were to lay hands on Saul, the Lord's anointed, what a terrible precedent would be set in the kingdom of Israel in which it would become permissible to slay anointed kings to claim the throne. Do not do something that will come to bite you in the long run. Second, she says, do not slay the fool because of self-salvation. She says this once in verse 26, and then again in verse 31, and David actually repeats this back to her in verse 33. Working salvation with his own hand would be what David is doing if he were to slay Saul and assume the throne of the kingdom with his own might. You see, David was to be king by promise, not by power. This is what the kingdom this is what the kings this is what the kingship is about in Israel. Unlike the pagan nations, the kings of Israel were not to live by the greatness of their armies, but by the power of their God. They were to live, they were not to live by wise military maneuvering through things like intermarriage with foreign nations. No, they were to live by the wisdom of God. The Lord, through Samuel, had promised the kingdom to David. And so David is called, not, is, is called to trust that the Lord will bring it to him and not to reach out and seize it with his own hand. If he does so, in verse 28, Abigail implies, he will be fighting his own battles and not the Lord's. Now, the setting in which all three of these encounters take place is key here. They all three take place in the wilderness. Now, in the Bible, the wilderness is often the place of testing. The Lord tested Israel in the wilderness, and they failed the test, and so they were uh, doomed to wander outside the promised land for 40 years. They failed the test, just like Adam before them, who ate the forbidden fruit and had to spend his life outside of the Garden of Eden. But now David is in the wilderness and he is put to the test. Will he reach out his hand to take that forbidden fruit? You know, vengeance on Saul, I'm sure, was very appealing to his eyes. A quick rise to the throne surely was pleasing. Will Adam be like Abraham, who had a promise from God that he would be made into a great nation? But instead of trusting God's promise in that moment, he slept with his servant Hagar in order to work his salvation by his own hands. Everything up until this point in the disappointing story of human history says, yes, indeed, this is what David will do. He will eat the forbidden fruit. He will sleep with the servant. He will fail the wilderness test. He will slay King Saul. But he doesn't. You know, in the New Testament, both Paul and the author to the Hebrews points to the wilderness generation as a warning, as an example, implying that we too are in some sense in a wilderness. And in our wilderness, we are not to follow the mold of the faithless Israelite. David here, however, is the faithful Israelite. He is the example we should follow. He passes the wilderness test. What was his test? Well, his test in temptation was to take a shortcut to power and to glory. It was to take a shortcut to reigning over the kingdom of Israel. You know, in our wilderness, we are tempted in the same vein. Created by God to reign and to rule, we hunger for this. Created by God as glorious image bearers of our Creator, we long for glory. And this, in and of itself, is not an evil thing. You know, when the serpent tempted Adam and Eve, he wasn't tempting them to something that was undesirable or even evil in itself. Likeness to God is a good thing. God created Adam and Eve in his likeness. Likeness to God is good. Ruling is good. Glory is good. And God promises these things to us. 
But the temptation we face in this age is to grasp onto these things by distrusting God's promise and His wise providence over us. To, we, we, we are tempted to take illicit shortcuts to them. We see this all the time. We want glory in school, so we cheat. We want power at work, so we lie and gossip about colleagues. We are opportunistic. If we see an opportunity to put someone else down and at the same time exalt ourselves, we take it. You know, I think it's important to notice or to realize that this, it would have been seen as very reasonable and even expected if David struck down Saul that day in the cave, just like he did Goliath before him. It was so rational and reasonable that the men interpreted the situation as permission from God. And this is how sin often is. It seems rational. It's, it seems reasonable. We may say something like, you know, I'm not hurting anyone else. Or, or maybe we say they deserve it. Or maybe more commonly, I deserve this, whatever this may be. Sexual gratification, success, status. You know, in a book by a professor named Jonathan Haidt uh, called The Righteous Mind, he makes a provocative point. He says that our reason serves our passion and not the other way around like we often think. He says our inner man is not what we think he is. We kind of think our inner man is a, a detective like Sherlock Holmes who's following the evidence no matter where it leads to arrive at the truth. He says that's not how the inner man is. What the inner man actually is is an attorney whose job is to defend and to justify whatever it is we want to do at all cost. You know, David could have so easily justified slaying Saul to himself and to his men. Saul deserved it. No one else would be harmed. This would be nice and clean. But he didn't do it. And this is because Lady Wisdom brought home the promise and providence of God to the heart of the future king of Israel. Abigail three times alludes to the promise and providence of God. Verse 28, the Lord will make you, certainly make you a sure house. Verse 29, if men rise up to pursue you and seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. In verse 30, she confesses, you will be prince over God's people. David stays his hands from touching the Lord's anointed. He refuses to take vengeance. He passes the wilderness test, refusing to take a shortcut. He does this because David believes the promise and trust the providence of his sovereign and gracious God. He can withhold vengeance against Nabal because he trusts that the Lord was the one who owns vengeance. In fact, ten days later, Nabal will be struck dead. And as David is standing over deep sleeping Saul, he says in chapter 26, verse 10, As the Lord lives... The Lord will stri strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will die in battle. The Lord forbid that I should put my hand out against the Lord's anointed. David does not need to enact vengeance on Saul because he knows that the Lord is the one who acts vengeance. And he does so shortly after David, I mean Saul, is struck down in battle. David does not need to make himself king by working salvation with his own hand because God will make him king through grace. The kingdom is not something that David is going to acquire by his warring hands or wise political maneuvering. It is something that will be given to him as a gift of grace by the promise and providence of his wise and loving God. Now, in these encounters, you're probably seeing yourself in the shoes of David, and you should. But we should also, and perhaps firstly, see ourselves in the shoes of David's men. 
You know, it's not just David that will be implicated in the slaying of Saul. It's his men as well. David is their representative. David is their king. What he does, they do. And it is only through David that their hands are stayed. David's restraint restrains his men. They can live by trusting the promise and providence of God because David does. And in this way, David is the foreshadow of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this part of the biography of David prepares us to receive the greater David, the greater Lord, the one who always remains faithful even when David does not. You know, Jesus had a wilderness temptation. Matthew chapter 4, the devil comes to Jesus in the wilderness. The devil says to him, bow down and worship me, and I will give you glory, and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. Jesus is offered a shortcut. God had indeed promised Jesus glory in the kingdoms of this world, but he would receive it through Golgotha. Jesus must first endure the wilderness of the cross before he receives the crown of the kingdom. And he does this for you and for me. So we can trust God's providence. We can trust God's promise. Jesus has already secured glory in the kingdom for us. You know, often vengeance sprouts up from the soil of glory hunger. We hunger for glory. We want to be glorified. We want to rule. And so when someone despises us, looks down upon us, belittles us, we feel robbed of glory. And so we lash out. And it is this same glory hunger that leads to taking shortcuts, to bowing to the devil. But in reality, those shortcuts are offering us something that we already have, if we only have the eyes of faith to see it. We are reigning in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. And when our Lord Jesus returns, we will reign fully with him in the kingdom of God. And because this is the case, we are called to rest from working salvation with our own hands, and to trust our sovereign and gracious God. David did not have to seize the kingdom of God. It was already his. And the glory that we are so tempted to fight for is our, already ours through the Lord Jesus Christ who lived, who died, and rose again as our victorious king.